Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the What Wine How Can I podcast. We have a special person here today. Her name is Diana. Um, I've known her for quite a while. We're not like best friends, but um, I think the first time we met was a uh, Slava Corral. Yes, uh, we were just saying <laughs> together, praise the Almighty Man upstairs, um, and then uh, kind of life happened, family happened. Um, so happy to have you on today. Thank you. Thank you for making time. I know you're a, a wife, a mother, and a and a busy lady. So I really appreciate this. Thank you. Um, let's start with, I already uh, named, gave you the wrong title. I thought you were some kind of insurance adjuster type thing, but you're in the insurance industry, but totally different. Yes. What is your title? Uh, currently, I am a consulting underwriter. Consulting underwriter. Okay, consulting means what um, and for whom? Consultant. So it's basically just a fancy title. Um, majority of what I do is underwriting. Mm -hmm. So basically I work with agents. So they come to me, they bring me business. I underwrite the account. Um, it's kind of similar to like a loan underwriter. When you come to the bank, there is an underwriter who basically says if you can have a loan or not based on your past financials and whatnot. So I do the same, but I do it in an insurance okay, format. Can you identify underwriter? Because I'm going to be honest with you, I heard <laughs> underwriter many times in exactly mm -hmm. that scenario. Loans when you're buying a home. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's in, the un it's in the underwriters. There, It's up to the underwriters. Mm -hmm. um, and in insurance, apparently there's underwriters. So yes. it's up to you <laughs> to what? Either give somebody insurance, give somebody a deal, or what exactly yes. do you do? Yes, so exactly that. So uh, when I get an application in, I review the account. So I, I can just look at the application or I can go online and look at their website. I look at their exposures, um, whatever they do. And I mainly focus on construction only. So okay. everything I do is based on contractors. Construction only. So you're only dealing with contractors. Yes. That's interesting. So, so. what type of insurance is this like... Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher the types of insurance, That's but okay. it's like, does this have to do with like workman's comp, like with people, with buildings, with equipment, all of it. So everything under like anything, yes. a, a construction contractor might need. Yes. Mm -hmm. Except I don't do employee benefits. Okay. Um, so I do workers comp, which is basically covering his, uh, his or hers or the company's employees. Mm -hmm. Um, I work with general liability. Days. <laughs> yes, days. <laughs> um, general liability, which covers anyone coming onto uh, like a job site and getting hurt or causing okay. third party property damage. So if they went and they like if it's a landscaper and they um, scratched a car that was parked on the side of the sheet, that's mm -hmm. that would be considered third party property damage. Okay. Um, and then I do property, which is just basically building location, any of the contents in the location. Um, mm -hmm. And then I do auto. Which... Okay, contents in the location is interesting. Yes. <laughs> um, I've always heard this theory that, and this might, this is, I guess, maybe that's more residential, not as commercial, but mm -hmm. I don't know. So say, for example, somebody owns a business and everything in their business burns down. That Their business burns down. Insurance needs a plot if you don't have a receipt for everything in there or video or pictures. How do take? Well, how does that scenario work? Can so you that's, like that's residential. That's okay. personal, uh, like a personal structure or like your home or whatever. Um, in commercial, you have limits. So okay. you insure your real property, which is the actual building, and then you insure business personal property, which is everything that goes inside of so the th building. So those are two separate. You separate. There's not separate. It's the same account. It's the same policy. It's just different limits for all of those. Mm, so okay. let's say uh, inside of your um, property, whatever mm -hmm. you're building, your office or maybe your shop, whatever it is that you have. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have um, equipment mm -hmm. that's business personal property. So that would be covered under business personal property. So okay. if it burns down, um, you would we would cover the real property, which is the actual building. And then whatever your limits were for business personal property as well. Okay, awesome. So if you have things inside your commercial property, you would insure them. So it's not like, oh, hey, I had a bunch of stuff that wasn't mm -hmm. insured, but I want to get paid for it. Yeah, so it's just your limits. If you had okay. enough limits to cover everything, which normally you want to, and there's right. worksheets that we give insurers that they can fill out to know how much to have. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also business income, which is separate. So let's say you're, which doesn't really happen in our case for contractors, because for contractors, you don't work at your 
location, you have job sites. So you're working at a job site. Mm. So if you're building burnt down, you can probably most likely still do your job. Mm -hmm. But a manufacturer, on the other hand, is completely different. So if, a, if your manufacturing plant burns down, there's business income loss. Okay, so, like so we much would pay for heavier, that. Yeah. Much heavier. So we would want, like if I was to underwrite a manufacturer, I would want them to have like a second location where like a backup location in case they burnt down for whatever reason. Oh, wow. So they have to have those plans. Yes. Okay. Business continuity plan. So okay. we want to make sure that they have something in place in case of emergency. Right, right. That makes sense. And that kind of safeguards um you, i guess the insurance company mm -hmm. from where yep. they don't have to pay out too much so that's yes. another thing i want to talk about uh all my life i hear like oh insurance companies are just out there they're never going to pay you anything they're just out there to screw everybody um <laughs> defend yourself <laughs> i guess easily Ooh. said if I was to show you our book and how it's performing and how much claims were paying you would definitely change your opinion yeah so when it comes to insurance it's definitely different from personal to commercial so you have to keep that in mind okay um we pay claims if it's covered so like for a building if it burnt down by a covered peril then yes peril. we would uh, peril meaning like a uh, fire like or a storm oh, like whatever. if all okay. of if those are under if those are covered under the form mm -hmm. then yes we'll pay it but of course we don't want to pay something that it's not you're not paying for like if you're yeah. not paying for it for earthquake coverage if there's an earthquake and you want you're going to open a claim we're not going to pay gonna... it we're going to decline it so it, basically anything in the form that's covered we'll pay it okay so in in commercial construction uh, a lot of contracts have these few words that say act of god um in the winter we're doing a, we're building a building it starts raining all of our interior drywall is wet um act of god hands up is that in in is that a peril is that not no. a peril the, no. and insurance usually <laughs> pays somehow um it How depends does that work? i think it depends what caused all of that so we would we would like to review um, in terms of like everything that they do from a control standpoint. So if they did everything possible to avoid a loss and they mm -hmm. st there still was a loss and it was covered under the form, then mm -hmm. we'll pay it. But we don't have anything in our forms that says act of God. <laughs> no, okay. Because um, then you can, you know, if you go to court, anyone can try to prove that it was an act of God when it really wasn't. So we try to be very specific in our yeah. forms. Our forms are written by very smart lawyers. Yeah, it's I a lot of that. nonsense and hard to understand. Um, I mean, we even have resources internally where they help us understand the form because yeah. sometimes it can be really tricky. And then, you know, you read it here and then you have to go to this page because it continues there. And then you have to go find a definition of what that is. So we try to be very specific in order to cover ourselves because throughout the years as insurance was building and they were writing forms, mm -hmm. like we would go to court for a certain claim. Definition. Yeah, a certain definition, which was too broad. So we had to narrow it down to make sure that contractor we... meaning blah, yes. blah, blah, blah. Yes, okay. exactly. Gotcha. So. Um, so I'm going to go like off topic and then we're going to come back. But okay. uh, but I just remember, I mean, it's kind of on topic. So um, global warming, the green, green initiative has nothing to do with insurance. But I heard this one man say, do you think if global warming was real, would insurance companies still insure all these buildings along the coast or right on the beach? Um, would they? So insurance adapts to anything that comes their way okay. um, in trans carriers. And we have to do that because if we didn't, we would we wouldn't make any money and we wouldn't okay. we would be out of business. So you you still take an, a risk. Yes. So like for a good example is COVID because mm -hmm. that just happened, right? Okay, yeah. So all of a sudden now you're seeing uh, contractors have these COVID supplementals they're filling out that carriers are creating, you know, what kind of safety do they have in place to make sure that their employees are safe, that um, if they work in an area where there is public exposure, how mm -hmm. do they protect the public, all of that. Mm. So we started adding into our coverage how to protect ourselves from that. And I think there was um, there was a certain something in our form that was already to an extent protecting us, but we'll adapt to that. We'll add that on. So now we're making sure that nobody's filing a claim because of COVID. Okay, so, that's actually a good topic. I'm, I'm happy you brought COVID up 
because COVID kind of, uh, for sure changed the world and we're never going back to normal. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. But, um, contract contractors were, I'm actually glad we're talking about like contractors here because that's, that's very, what you do, right? Yeah. That's dear. There you go. That's dear to me. <laughs> Near and dear to your heart. <laughs> so a lot of contractors paid a lot of money. Uh, for a bunch of jobs being pushed for guys not being able to show up to work for two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I remember when, when I remember the day that COVID happened, it, it feels like it was yesterday, like March 19th. March 19, 2020. 2020. We would open up, uh, like, I was in, on a job site in a trailer. Uh huh. And I opened up the window, and the electricians next door are all, like, talking to their wives. I opened up this window. The plumbers are talking to their family, like, get the food, get the kids, pack. Like, this oh, other gosh. guy's, like, I hear two people talking about, like, getting extra rounds for their guns. <laughs> like, it was crazy. <laughs> um,. How did the insurance world like react right away? Uh, like, cause you know, claims are coming. Yeah. yeah, no. So I don't, there was a lot of misunderstanding, um, mm -hmm. obviously. So what happened for us is they just literally put us all home. They sent us monitors. They sent us everything that we needed to work from home. Okay. And to be honest, we did better at home for the last two years than when we were at in the office. I heard a lot of stories um, like that. Much more productive. Yeah. yeah, very productive. And I think like we killed our numbers, everything, because insurance, you still need insurance, regardless yeah. if you're operating or not. So what happened is a lot of contractors came to their brokers and they're like, hey, we're not working. What do we do? Can we change our payroll? Because we rate based on payroll for general liability, okay, which is a big chunk of the insurance they pay. So they're like, can we change our payroll? So obviously we had to consider our ourselves as well yeah, yeah. so and 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 if we end you up gotta stay giving, alive too yeah if we start giving back premium what is that going to do to our financials mm -hmm. um so what we ended up doing is just saying hey you're totally fine because what what happens for a gl policy at the end of the year a couple of months after the renewal we audit the policy so basically okay. an auditor reaches out to the insured and they collect the actual numbers so that if they did more we charge more if they did less we give, give back, back. okay so we just said you know what at audit everything will be picked up so you're totally fine we calm them down I, I i believe if my memory serves me right and this happened for everybody in terms of auto there's a lot of people complaining that they're not driving they're still paying the same premiums yeah so the insurance department said hey you have to somehow give premium back to your insureds so we got it i'm sure you remember you got it and yeah. we did the same thing for our insureds we gave some premium back to help them because they I mean, some of them went out of business, unfortunately. Yeah. Some of them larger enough were able to stay in business, but they That's wanted some kind of compensation for it. That's interesting that insurance companies actually kind of like, I guess, in a good way, bent over and like paid back premiums. Yes. Because essentially like you go to a store, like all sales are final, like who... We don't know no no yep. co we no COVID yeah. or whatever your yeah. letters say. Yeah. Act of God. We didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. That's just the way life unfolds. Yeah. Next year, plan for that. Um. So that's interesting. And it was it was huge, not just for commercial, for everyone. I mean, you're talking about millions of personal lines autos that you know. Even if you got five hundred dollars back, that's yeah. at, multiply that by millions of people. Yeah. Like that was a that's a big a hit lot. they yeah. <laughs> took. That's a that's a big hit for sure. Everybody took, and then. PPP loans, um, were insurance companies given those? I, I guess everybody was right. And if you need, honestly, it. I don't know because so with us, there's not, it's not just premium that we're collecting. We're also, there's an investment part okay. to, to insurance. So I'm pretty sure this is, we're talking about home office stuff that yeah, I yeah. don't deal with on okay, a regular gotcha. basis. Um, but from that standpoint, obviously we couldn't go out to see anyone because there's a lot. So there's a huge expense where underwriters actually do their own marketing. They go out to see agents and all of that stuff. So mm. it kind of balanced each other out. Um, and I say this on a high level because mm -hmm. I don't know the exact, but okay. I know from since COVID hit until now, we've been financially really stable. Um, cause there's a lot, I, I mean, imagine hundreds and thousands of employees no longer traveling and there's no more expense reports coming in because yeah. everything is done over the phone. 
that's a huge profit for the insurance company. Um, and the, in, in return, I mean, we still continued with promotions and building our careers, yeah. all of that. It pretty much didn't really affect us in a way, um, except we had to do it from home as opposed yeah, to the office. That's pretty cool. In in my industry, we like we still got promotions and mm -hmm. and and uh, colas and all that type mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, but some people in the auditing world, like financial auditing, they got cut like literally two weeks after mm -hmm. COVID hit, got cut, pay cuts, all this type of stuff. I was like, dude, that's yeah. insane. That's um, hard. Yeah, that's that's tough. So that's well. So it's good to know that an in insurance industry is much more stable than nursing. Absolutely. Um, it's <laughs> very stable. I know it's not a, as they say, a sexy job, but yeah. it's kind of like accounting. We will always need accountants as long as we have businesses running. Same with insurance. And so like insurance has like a bad rap, right? People typically when people call an insurance broker or mm -hmm. insurance agent, it's because they have to pay for something they don't want to pay. Mm -hmm. um, they're either in a car accident, uh, something burned down. Like it's usually the lows. Mm -hmm. um, life insurance. Some people think that that's a scam and all that stuff you focus on something totally different mm -hmm. um underwriting so agents come to you mm -hmm. to approve so do, is this agents from different companies is this agents yeah. from a certain company no so there's different agencies all around us um you probably don't pay much attention to them um mm -hmm. so like a big one that i that i manage is called united valley mm -hmm. which is a cluster they have a lot of like these small mom and pops that are under them um, because like your small agency that has one location located somewhere, I mean, you don't even know where they're located, mm -hmm. is not going to have access to all the big carriers. Like I work for CNA, which is one of the largest carriers, commercial carriers. There's Travelers, which you probably know, Liberty Insurance, mm -hmm. there's Zurich. So they won't have access to these big, big companies, which they want access because they, they can send their clients to us. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll have them join these big clusters like United Valley. And United Valley has an appointment with CNA. And then they have an appointment with other carriers, large carriers. Okay. Can you explain to me this dynamic? Um, because it honestly, I'm remembering the episode from Office where Michael's trying to tell everybody that it's not a pyramid. But whatever he's drawing <laughs> it's a, is a pyramid. Um, you mentioned smaller agencies and all these agencies. And they report to all these bigger companies and, and so on how does all that work like and why are they mm -hmm. so intertwined together yeah so i mean there's some standalone agencies you don't have to be part of a cluster to have access like if you're big enough as a retail agency you can come directly to us and get an appointment okay. the only thing that we require in order to get an appointment with us because you have to bring us a certain amount of business within a year okay. and so that's something that you would commit as an agency in order to have an appointment with us and an appointment means you can do business with us okay. so you can send us submissions but it's the underwriter's responsibility to build relationships with your agents because if we we don't go directly to our insurance so i can't go to a contractor and write their insurance i have to go through an agent okay so it's the agent's job to go out there and find clients I have a relationship with the agent, they'll send me business. So the agent is like a real estate agent, the middleman between the, middle the man. loaner mm -hmm. or the the loan, the bank and the buyer yes. or seller. Yes. So okay, we pay we pay sense. commission to our agents. So if they bring us new business and we actually bind it with CNA, mm. we pay them a commission for that. Okay. So what you actually want to be in insurance is an underwriter or like if you want an insurance business be the underwriting business mm -hmm. not the really the agent i mean it depends if you if you're a go-getter and you like living on commission and you think that you can succeed and you can sell by all means there's yeah, yeah. a lot of very successful agents out there who Correct. are uh, i mean if if you're bringing in like last year i wrote a million dollar account and he gets paid 15 percent off of that that's a pretty penny in his yeah. pocket. You know what I mean? So, and some of them, I mean, a million is just a million. There's some accounts that are much bigger than that. But if you can succeed as an agent and that's kind of your groove and you mm -hmm. think you, you'll you do a good job, go for it. I like to have a stable salary that yeah, yeah. <laughs> every year, every two weeks that comes into my bank and I can yeah. pay my bills and I feel just great. Yeah, <laughs> so it, Nothing's like odd. Oh, let's go and try to run around and sell some stuff exactly and with them it's uh, a lot of them are on call 
I mean, if uh, some of these companies are working weekends, I mean, contractors always work weekends, mm -hmm. right? right? So if something happens, guess who they're calling? Their agents. agent. They're not calling me. My phone is turned off for the weekend. Yeah. So I never see myself doing so their job. like the bougie insurance side. I mean, yeah. in a good way. In a good not way. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Not like, uh... I yeah, am not your way. farmer's agent trying to chase you to write your What's insurance. What's her name? What's Progressive's name? The lady, the little Flo. Yeah. Flo, you're not Flo. I'm you're, not Flo at you're all. You're the ch person that Flo calls and says, "Hey, I got, I have Greg here. He really needs yes, help." Okay. Yes. All right. That that makes uh, that makes a lot more sense. Now I understand why underwriters are um, are important. So, you work for an underwriting company. I mean, or, or how do you call a, that what you carrier we just a call carrier. it yeah okay so a carrier is like a bigger insurance mm -hmm. or is it like something that that we don't know what their name is no so like uh there's major carriers like i mentioned already mm -hmm. cna is one of them uh people don't know about cna because cna is primarily focused on commercial insurance okay, so your gotcha. average joe isn't we gonna know about them. them yes um there's travelers which they do right personal lines um mm -hmm. that you know about there's liberty liberty mutual Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about Zurich. I don't know if they write um, personal or not, but like these, these are the major ones, but there's a ton of different companies. Um, I mean, you can go into the weeds. There's just so many different so, areas and all of so that. So there's big companies and then you can become like subcontractors to these companies, bring them business and you get commission. Yes. That makes a ton of sense. Okay. Um, a day in the office or at home? What, is, what, what does that look like for you? You wake up, I mean... Do you guys always meet with agents? Do you have certain days that you go uh, lunch with agents? Yeah. So you basically, as a senior underwriter, so when I was just an underwriter and then I became a specialist, now a consultant, in my, I'm considered more of a senior underwriter at this okay. point. So I basically operate on my own. I need very little management support, only when something is outside of my authority yeah, and yeah. I can't make that decision. I have to go to them. You know, which, what, you know what they say, like <clears throat> outside of my pay range, we're going to go talk to somebody Right, else. we're going to go yeah. talk to the big guys. Yeah. Which even then, my, my manager always tells me, don't say you have to go to the manager, say you have to go discuss it internally because mm -hmm. you don't want to devalue yourself in front of your agents. You want them to trust you mm -hmm. and know that you're going to... You do, make you, you call you the make, shots. Yeah, exactly. Because if not, they're going to... I mean, and I've seen this a lot because when I was a younger underwriter, it was a lot of like, oh, I'm sure you have to go check with your manager and you get that sense Excuse like they don't me? trust you. You know what 100%, I mean? hundred percent. And that, that's what happens to me. Um, I've been recently experiencing that because like, a lot of people that I deal with are like 50 plus and contractors, you know, their attitude towards yep. things and they're like, Hey kid, go talk to your boss. Like, Excuse me, sir. I am the boss. <laughs> um, yeah, I will try to be, I'm going to go, I'm going to go confirm with my team, make sure we're on the yeah. same page. Yeah. So for me, I operate, operate on my own. Um, so I get to decide when I want to go travel and see someone, um, a day and just at like, a desk day so we have new business we're working on and then we have renewals that we're working on so every month um we have annual policies so if okay. you get a policy a contractor policy that's going to be for one year next year we're going to review it normally i review any renewal policy 90 days in advance because there's certain laws that we have to follow so like if we wanted to send a specific notice that hey we're going to do this at renewal I have to send it 60 days in advance okay the insured has to know about it so that's getting into too much detail but I'll review 90 days in advance and start working on the renewal. We'll talk with the agent, um, negotiate what the renewal is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't market this account. You know, we're going to do a good job on the renewal. So just having those kind of conversations. And then, of course, chasing new business. That's where the fun is. Um, that's where you want to bring more business in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so retaining business is, of course, really good. And you want to make sure you, you're retaining business because if you're not retaining and just bringing in new business, you're not really growing. So... But the new business is where the fun is. You're bringing in a new account. You get you get to like dig into it and understand what they do, understand the exposures, and then start underwriting. Like, how would you price this? Okay, two questions. First one is, can you share any secrets about like uh, if I'm renewing my insurance and I still want like the same good rate, mm -hmm. and they say, oh, if that was actually for the 12 months we had a deal. Now it's up. Like, how do I keep that deal? What do I tell them? Share some insight on <laughs> trade secrets. So I think it's, it has to do a lot with your negotiation skills as well. Okay, <clears> I, like where, I like where this is going. Uh, if you can negotiate, I mean, we've, uh, 
a good example is a contractor who's trying to negotiate rate with us. And he's like, mm-hmm. you guys are doing a great job, but this is what I want. And it's like, well, if we're doing a great job, why would we give you what you want? Like, we're already doing a great yeah, yeah, job. Yeah. So just a bad negotiator. Okay. Um, so one way to try to keep your rate low is um, you had no losses. That's a huge one. Okay. Anytime there's losses, anytime there's claims. Safety es- incidents. Mm-hmm. Especially for general liability because general liability, their claims happen, they don't happen very often. Um, if you're a good contractor and you mm-hmm. have all the right um, controls in place. Okay. Um, so you can you can use that as a negotiation tactic. And I get that all the time, um, which I know what to say to. Look at our safety program <laughs> and this Exactly. And that. So you can, you can try pointing them into what you are doing to actually make sure that there's no claims going forward as well. Mm-hmm. That will help keep the rate flat. Um, but you also have to know which line of business you're trying to negotiate because if it's the auto, you're not going to win. Auto's like impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. I try every time. It's very, very, very hard. They don't. I mean, it, w- when we're talking about like personal lines, they don't even care. They won't even negotiate with you. If you say I'm leaving, they, t- they say bye. Yeah. When do we cancel your policy? Yeah. Um, in commercial, it's a little bit different. We don't look at any specific auto. So we rate it and we look at it as a whole and what they're doing and what the losses look like. But it's really hard so because like, autos- like, how does this account doing? F- what does this yes. account do for us? Exactly. So and I mean, sometimes there's they'll come to us and they're like, there's a 50 percent loss ratio. That's good. You guys are still making money, but there's expenses and ROE and everything that's added on top of that. And next thing you know, they're more at like 70, 80 percent and mm-hmm. maybe a couple more losses and they'll be at 100 percent, which means we're making no money at, at that okay. point. We're just collecting enough premium to pay their losses and that's it. Makes sense. So we want profitable accounts, but you yeah. can always negotiate. You can find tactics and um, try to find a middle ground. That's what you, I mean, our goal is that our agents and our insureds are also happy. It's not just about us making money. Right, right. At it's the about end of the a day, relationship. Everybody has to make yes. a little bit. Yes. Okay. Um, new, talking about new clients and new accounts. Um, take me back to like a day where you like landed like your, like your dream client or dream account. So for us, I don't think it's more of like a dream client. It's more of the size of the account. Okay, um, well, that's so, a good dream. Yes. So <laughs> okay. for us, uh, we we obviously, we all have new business goals that we need to reach every year. Okay. So I rather do it with a million dollar account than write five little ones. Okay. Because that's a lot more work. Um, so last year was... Um, Last year was a killer year for me because I came back in 2021, January 2021 from maternity leave. Okay. Um, I had my little girl. I came back. I was ready to nice. work. And I started working. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I started working. And I think I hit like end of February, beginning of March. I started writing new business. And then, of course, I got pregnant again. <laughs> so I had to like buckle down and yeah. finish working for the year. So within nine months, I wrote. 3 million of new business, which is very good if you're wondering. <laughs> yeah, I am wondering. That's, so, <laughs> that's awesome. See, it's like that mama bear and you came out and you just took care yeah, of business. Yeah, I was like, I got to take care of business before I leave and, yeah. and make sure my desk is clean and all of that. So um, it's more of the size of the account that you write that matters more, at least to me. So okay. um, last year, that's what happened. And I think there was this account that I wrote came in and it was garbage i mean just at a first glance it was garbage the auto had like a couple of half a million dollar losses they primarily work in the san francisco area or bay area and you know just over overall that's their area where they work so obviously there's a lot of claims because there's a lot of traffic Mm -hmm. um horrible claims there's a couple of claims where people were seriously injured or even died from an accident Jeez. Um, so this like they come to me well, is this like an uber company uh, or something no contractor oh my god underground okay. utility contractor you'd be surprised that's insane um the thing with with contractors like that is their auto schedule first of all this account is huge so their auto schedule is huge and they have a lot of very heavy like truck tractors which okay. if one of those hits a car that's a serious accident, yeah. even if it's just like a little bump in the back. I mean, we're talking about huge machines yeah, here. Yeah. Um, dozers and stuff. Yeah. So they came to me. We write no business with this agency. They come to me and they send it in and they're like, hey, we need your help here. And I'm like, dude, like, what do you want? What do you want, do you want from, from me? me? Yeah. I, I can't make this happen. He's like, please just try. So I sit down with them. I have like a meeting, an hour long meeting. I'm gathering all of this underwriting information. 
crossing my fingers, putting together this killer email and I'm sending it to my manager and I said, hey, if we are ever going to get on this account, this is the year because we can charge so much premium. Mm. They have no choice at this point because they're being non-renewed. They have a bunch of claims. They need someone to come in and save them basically. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we did. We came in and saved them. And on top of that, we said, we're going to write your workers comp. We're going to write your GL. We're going to write your property. We're going to write your inland marine. Yeah, everything. If we're going to go in, we're going all in. All in, which yeah. means we ended up writing a million dollar account, which helps fund for any loss. Like uh, their auto limit is a million. Yeah. So if they have a million dollar loss, we just made a million. So yeah. the larger the account, the easier it is for us to kind of swallow large um, claims because okay. we're we're, get, we're getting enough premium yeah, yeah. for it. So okay. yeah, at the end of the day, it ended up like we it started at like four hundred thousand. I was like, wow, that's a nice size account, and it just started building. And we went to home office, and they're like, we want this and this. It and sounds this. like Papa John's <laughs> upselling all their th uh, cheese stuff Toppings. across them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but th that that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Like if, if a customer is so high risk and they mm -hmm. have so much problems, I mean, we talk about this all the time. Safety is number one. Safety is number one. Yes. Take care of our guys in the morning, like lost work, guys getting hurt, comp, workers comp is like the mm -hmm. last thing you want. Yeah. Because yeah. then it doesn't allow us or contractors in general to bid certain size mm -hmm. projects or certain projects with certain GCs and all that. Exactly. Stuff. Which is a huge thing because they actually had an issue with that. They worked for PG&E mm, okay. and PG&E is so top notch and they require that you have a, a specific um, X mod on your workers comp. And if it's above that, you need to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so they, ju they didn't just need a company to write their insurance. They needed a company to come and basically save them and help them turn all of that around, which is where our risk control came in. Okay, so, so we, like back them up and say like, hey, this is actually a good company. We're behind them. Yeah, so risk control was out there, I think, every quarter, just going through their operations and showing them and telling them how they can improve in order to minimize their losses. Okay. So we came in as a like one team solution for them, not just underwriting. We had risk control and we had client service manager, which client service manager comes in and they help them uh, from a claim standpoint. So they're mm -hmm. like go-to person for like any claim. Hey. I don't know what's going on with this claim. Can you help me? And she would turn around then and find that claim, get all the information and come back to them. That's so we came in as like one big team and upsold them on everything. And boom, before you know it. I mean, it, it was good for you and then it was good for them. It was, they can continue yeah, business. It was a mutual agreement. I got the new business. They got a good carrier covering them, helping yeah. them. So it worked out at the end of the day. That's awesome. Yeah. Usually insurance agents will say this, hey, help you save money. Uh, project you forward savings account change people's lives <laughs> i mean without you diana they would not be in business so thank you uh, yes um fully fingers yeah. crossed they don't have any losses you know i mean sometime at at some point you got to wake up and say okay let's let's be serious about this stuff and uh we gotta stay in business so so that's a little bit about the what um how in the world or why did you end up in insurance like is this something like as a little girl when your dad asked you like Dianka what do you want to be dad I want to be an insurance underwriter <laughs> like how did everything in your life kind of come down I guess I, I guess maybe share a little bit of your life story because there's going to be a bunch of kids people in high school people in college people with careers that maybe are looking to change careers mm -hmm. and kind of walk us down your path a little bit yeah so no I did not wake up one day and say I want to be an underwriter um, if you talk to any insurance professional, they will tell you they fell into it. Okay. At least on the commercial side. I know some of those state farm agents are really, they really want the job. <laughs> they want to be in the commercial. I think that's they, what it is. Yeah, maybe, perhaps. I don't know. Um, but a lot of us fall into it. And I, to some extent, did as well, even though I majored partially in insurance. So I went to Sac State and I mm -hmm. majored in business. Um, okay. And then I did three concentrations finance, risk management, and insurance, which is okay. where I am, and then international business. I really wanted to do finance. It was really fascinating to me. I wanted to do um, stock trading and all of that. Mm, Wall Street. Yes. The Wolfina. You wanted to be the Wolfina. I okay. wanted to, yes, okay. very badly. And then as I'm approaching graduation, I started researching and looking into it. And I mean, these financial analysts are working 80-hour weeks and they are underpaid and if you're a woman it's even worse yeah you're you're basically oh, don't get me started about this inequality <laughs> <laughs> and it's it, 
I know that it's not real, but in certain I places, it, yeah. I think it's still very much real. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted a family. And even though I didn't have one at that moment, I said, you know what? I still need to somehow build my career in a way where if I do and when I do have a family, I can be there. Um, mm-hmm. So I started looking at options. Well, can we stop right there? Like yes. that is that is not something many women um think about when they go to work um and the and the sad and what what the saddest part about all that is about that whole scenario is the fact that when they don't think about it say you didn't pl- think like hey i'm gonna want a family and you went into mm-hmm. your own thing mm-hmm. and then the time comes where you're distraught between two choices yep. your career or your family yep um and unfortunately Look, I know it's 2022 and we've seen pictures and videos of men getting pregnant, but <laughs> usually it's women getting pregnant. <gasps> yes. <laughs> and that's the way it's going to be as far as I can yeah. tell. Yeah, yeah. So w- kudos to that. But what do you have to say maybe to a girl that's out there like, wow, how did you plan for that? Like, what's the difference between those 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 careers? Yeah, so insurance and most carriers they have a huge focus on work-life balance okay um they so like for us we're not hourly we're salary obviously but for us a full work day is seven and a half hours as long as you put your seven and a half hours on you're good um and that's so you guys are hourly or salary we're salary but when you look into like if you go to my timesheet and you look at each day and what the hour they put in it's seven Mm -hmm. and a half Okay. They don't want us overworked. Um, none of our managers want us or overworked. And if we are working longer than we should be, then they need to sit down with us and they need to review our load and see what needs to come off. Like right now, we're understaffed by one underwriter. Okay. And we can see how that affects all of us. Um, so for insurance, any carrier, as far as I know, work-life balance is huge. Um, there is a carrier that I recently spoke to and she said that they actually have Friday short days during the summer. Like the company actually tells you, you are free to go at 2.30 in the afternoon and enjoy Nooner your weekend. Or sooner. Yeah. That's awesome. So I think for me, that was a seller because um, I wanted to also enjoy my life and not just be dedicated 100% to work. Yeah. Um, I am a workaholic when I'm at work. And the minute I sign, I sign off, yeah. I am focused on my a family. Yeah. Yes, I am focused on my babies, my husband. And for me, that's that's huge. And it was like that ever since I started underwriting. So it's not like I had to build myself to that. No, I okay. I started underwriting. It was the same thing they preached to me then that they preached to me now. And that to me was just a huge sell, like huge. Um, okay, that's pretty awesome. And I just started looking into it more. I started talking to people who are going in there. I joined a um, SIF. No, not SIF. Uh, basically, it's a... A fraternity? GIS, kind of, <laughs> okay. in, a, in a way, it kind of is. Um, and it's basically just all about insurance. And they have different professionals coming out and speaking about what they do, um, underwriting claims. Um, there is also one for workers' comp where, where they like do investigations about, okay. you know, people who are lying about their workers' comp claims, oh which is a goodness. whole different story. I got some crazy <laughs> stories. Like, and there's, there's a lot of stories and, and yeah. some of them get pretty funny, but investigations, all of that, SIU, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started learning about all of that and I thought underwriting would be a good fit for me. It's it's kind of similar to finance and like investing because you, the way that we operate is we invest in a way like we say yes or no. So we have to make sure that this is a good insured, same as with financial analysts. They have to make sure it's a good stock before they invest into it and they read their financials and their future and all of that. Mm-hmm. We basically look, do the same thing. So we are putting our company's money on the line okay. because if they're not profitable, we lose money. And if right. they're profitable, we make money. So yeah. I was like, you know what? It's kind of somewhat similar. Let me just look into it and, and see what it does. And then um, a lot of business students already have jobs lined up fall before they graduate. graduate. So in spring, they're pretty much all business students are set. At least the ones who are serious about continuing and getting a career okay. um, and so I didn't have anything and I was so nervous and yeah, I was interviewing I, I was applying like crazy and I was like I cannot graduate without a job this is like I just can't I need something so 
I interviewed for a company and they, they didn't take me. And then this one came up, CNA. And one of my friends at college already mm -hmm. had a job with them. He already mm -hmm. got interviewed because um, we used to do this like huge interview and we used to bring in like 30 candidates and interview all of them. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's scary because like you're yeah. putting me on the test and I don't know if I can with sell myself. People. Exactly. And so when I came in, they needed to fill one more spot. So they had only I was competing against three other people. Mm -hmm the amount of work I did to compete against those three other people was far beyond what I should have done. Okay. I, I was going to say <laughs> if it's, if it was worth it, tell us about it so other people know, but I mean, you still want to prepare. So the one thing I did is I went and I re read reviews of past employees and what they had to say about the company. I had to look at what the negatives were and was I, would I be okay with those negatives? And of course, every company, like it's been eight years since I've been with them. So they have transformed majorly. So mm -hmm. I read all of the reviews and I was like, you know what? I think I still like this company. I went and I just to impress them, I did a full financial review of the company and I like had this whole binder that like had everything in there laid out um, only to find out that they are, they don't, they're not fully owned. So what I saw on Yahoo Finance was only 10% of what the company actually is because they're owned by a Lloyd's company. Okay, okay. Completely different and a whole they different They played you a little bit. Yeah, so the, the 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 guy who I was interviewing with, I, I'm so proud of this and I'm presenting it all to him and I'm like, he's going to be so impressed. And he's like, you know, this is just 10% of what CNA actually is. And I just like sat in my, I mean, in my but, seat and I'm like, oh gosh, this is so embarrassing. But at the same time, that was cool to find out that there's 90% more to this company. Exactly. Which is you want to work for a company that has strong financials. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is because even CNA about five years ago had to lay off people. They had to restructure and they had to see how things are done and they had to lay off people. Okay. And you don't want to work for a company that's constantly laying people off because then you're, you're going to become one of those people. They call it turnover rate, right? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, they tried to hide it under that. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Um, so I remember also interviewing with someone else. I had to interview with like four different people. And one of them was all about ethics. And I am so... Do you sag? Do you... I am so new to this industry that it like caught me so off guard. Um, the question he asked was, hey, there's an agent who's telling you, hey, can you come down and can you charge this premium? And in return, I'm going to send you to, I don't remember, he said some Hawaii. kind of island. Yeah, Hawaii. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at him and I'm like, yeah, I would do it. And he's, he's look, like, I'm at this point tired. I've been interviewing yeah. all day. And I'm like, yeah, I would do it. And he looks Hawaii at me, he's like, deal. Are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I'm sure I'll do it. And like, then he starts explaining to me everything. And like, I just turned completely red. And I'm so embarrassed because that was like the worst answer you can possibly give. Well, you should have said like, well, it depends the, on the resort and like. Right. Make it worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's so, hilarious. Um, at the end of the day, they still hired me. And I think a couple of years later, I talked to one of the guys because I was reporting to him at one point. And I yeah. said, hey, Justin, um, you know, how did I stack up against others? And he's like, Diana, don't even ask because you killed it compared to everyone else. And even was, with that bad answer. Even with my mistake. <laughs> yeah, I'm still still. But I over prepared because I said I need to have a job before I graduate. Yeah. I got the job a couple of weeks after I graduated, which is fine. But um, that's kind of how it all transpired. And here I am eight years into it and still still here. <laughs> still here. That's pretty awesome. That's a funny story. I mean, if I was interviewing you, I would have said, OK, at least she's being honest. Maybe that's why I got the that's job. <laughs> probably she's like, OK, she's being honest. So we just need to make sure she just if she's in Hawaii, doesn't Make sure that. we pay. She paid for it, you know, or what? We look out for stuff. So now every time you're on vacation, Justin's checking your. Uh, yeah. Your He's your. He's no longer with our company, but. Oh. Um, yeah, that was. A, I'm sorry, Justin. Hopefully, you're in a better place. He is. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, what? Why? How can I? Um, like you said, a lot of insurance companies that or agents or people that work for insurance mm -hmm. kind of fall into it. Yeah. Why is it not something in your opinion? Why is it not something like 
oh, I want to do nursing. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, mm-hmm. I want to be in real estate. Mm-hmm. Is there like a void between marketing for insurances? Mm-hmm. Do insurance companies not market on purpose? Like, what is that? I think that has a lot to do with it is how they market. Insurance in general is not a very sexy job, like I already said. Yeah. Um, you People are, I mean, in college right now, tech is huge. And we live in an area where we are affected by that. Um, If you go to the East Coast, the story is completely different. Insurance is viewed very differently there. It's a career. It's an option. It's a good option. Yes. Talk to me about this. Which I never knew about. But here on the West Coast, because tech is so popular here, everyone's focused on going into tech so that they don't really look at their options. But tech is very limited, too. Like, you have to be smart. You have to know what you're doing to be in tech, too. You have to take a lot of courses. Um, you have to and, learn to code. Yeah, exactly. Engineering is not easy. Like no. it's all very hard stuff. So I think we just don't market enough. And the thing is, there's a lot of opportunity in insurance because what happened is, um, remember those baby boomers mm-hmm. way back in the day? They're all retiring. Yeah. There's like we need gaps to be filled. So I feel like there's like the opportunity for growth and advancement is huge huge and you can you can I, become whatever you want to become an insurance dude, that's in everywhere right now that's true that's crazy except tech <laughs> except tech yeah it's full of a bunch of young millennials tiktokers and exactly everything so else one thing i think is the salary makes a huge difference mm-hmm. and i think that a lot of them are looking at all of these tech positions that are you know starting salaries like 150 and up that's yes it's crazy it, it could be i mean in the past two years salaries went up from 100k to 200k yes, for a tech easy and i think that okay that's good and i like all of that but what there's no stability at all yeah. i don't think um you well, know. every tech company is laying off like 10 percent now yeah so if there's uh if there's another bubble that decides to burst half of them are going to lose their job if not more yeah. where i my job is we stable. don't need instagram no we can, we can no be without Twitter. But hey, guess guess what? Instagram needs me. Yeah, to ins- you know <laughs> to ensure them exactly. So, who's your who? Can you say who your who your who your biggest account is? I can't. You can't. That'd be interesting to know. Uh, maybe after this, we'll see. Yes. Um, <laughs> the okay. So uh, so onward with kind of like how insurance doesn't market enough. Yeah, I think there's a lot of room and potential. So what I used to do, so um, a piece of advice for anyone if they are starting out as a new employee. Uh, my biggest thing when I start out at any company, any the, anything that I do, you have to become an asset. So you can't just be someone. Bring value. You have to bring value. You can't just be someone like if they are laying someone off, you can't be that person. And yeah. I told myself that all the time. I can't be that person. I need to bring value. So when I was a trainee, there's very little that I can do from an insurance standpoint. So I was like, I need to do something to help bring value. So mm-hmm. I started doing these visits to um, school, all of the different colleges. I would go and I would talk about insurance. Mm, okay. I would visit GIS, which is the what we discussed um, mm-hmm. like a li- little insurance geek place. Um, and I just spoke up about my job and what I do and I spent time with them. So basically I helped recruit talent, gotcha. um, which our branch right now, like my team, there's two other underwriters and my manager. We're all from Sac State and we are like, we're an asset to the company. Hitting Sac State hard yeah. now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I think that's what kind of I focused on then and then eventually became an underwriter and like kind of all went away. So I think there's a lack of marketing that can still be applied because if you see a job like a tech job and an underwriting job, obviously most people are going to opt out for the tech. So it's just lack of knowledge too, I think. I I think lack of knowledge for sure, because a lot of people that like I had no idea how cool my job is how cool your (laughs) job is dan i mean i'm blown away um no i had no idea like that there's that there are these types of i guess opportunities Mm -hmm. out there you know like i hear all the time about like oh come sell insurance for me and you're always trying to recruit somebody under you to sell insurance and somebody under you and everybody thinks of insurance of this unstable salesman job Mm -hmm. Um, but it's totally different from like, from your perspective. Very different. So like, I want to talk to one of my sisters now and be like, yo, this is a, a pretty cool option for you. Um, you know who you are. So 
So that's pretty cool. Um, in rec- recruiting, like if you were to recruit somebody, what would you tell them? Like when when you go when you go to the college, if somebody's going into finance and mm-hmm. somebody's going to besides besides like uh, telling them your story, how you kind of were looking, you were mm-hmm. going into finance. Like, what would you tell them? What are you know? Uh, if they want to join insurance, mm-hmm. um, first of all, whenever I went recruiting, I looked at people's personalities because those are things you can't train. Insurance okay. can be learned and everything in insurance can be learned. Personalities can't. Uh, for me, that was a big thing because insurance is a very um, relationship based business. If you can't maintain and make new relationships, you're not going to succeed because the business flow that we get in from our agents is huge like the huge part of that is based on relationship obviously we offer a good product mm-hmm. which sells itself mm-hmm. but let's say if if you're my agent or the and, law sells it but okay. yeah if you're my agent and you absolutely hate working with me because i don't respond or i never smile or whatever yeah. the case is you're not like you're gonna try to avoid sending business to me so one thing i looked is personalities but then you also want to build yourself up like join some kind of associations or on on campus like if there's any kind of like gis is one of them for insurance like Mm -hmm. join go in sit on a couple of meetings and see if it's a fit for you um but for right now we do focus on them having at least a business degree whereas before it was any degree you you can come in and work in insurance i mean i i reported to a guy who had a history degree who had a music degree like there's a huge range of different people who do different things yeah, yeah. and it's not to say that you can't still go into underwriting you can you would probably just have to start like an associate so basically like an assistant kind of like and lower, you can, lower yeah and you can build yourself up to underwriting but mm-hmm. if you have a business degree you can easily go into a trainee program and there's a lot of carriers like we offer a trainee program that so it's like a little private course no so basically a trainee program it it took us from june Mm -hmm. until january they were training us so they were basically we were learning the systems we were learning the forms the coverage how to maintain relationships all of that and is this a paid training program yes so it's like a uh something a little bit better than an internship yeah exactly oh that's pretty awesome yeah so when i got hired um i started in san francisco which is why i ended up moving from sacramento i moved in san francisco um, and then a couple of weeks later, they sent us to our home office in Chicago. So basically they put us all so you moved to Chicago for a month. Okay. Yes. But, and literally because it, they put us all into um, apartments. It was obviously cheaper to rent an apartment for a month than to put us all into hotels. Yeah. But so, yeah, they put us into this like this nice part of um, Chicago downtown mm-hmm. into these high rises. I was like on the 20th floor. All uh, the friends are like, OK, now she's an influencer for life. Right. Yeah. Right. What did she do? <laughs> um, so we did that. And then for a month, we came back and applied everything that we learned in Chicago. And Chicago was basically just like a classroom setting where you're just learning, asking questions, applying things. You come back to your home office, wherever you're, you're, you are, Mm -hmm. which for me was San Francisco. You work with the underwriters there with management, you apply everything and then you go back for another month, I believe. And then once you come back for the next six months, they're just like drilling everything into you. You're learning, you're just taking it all in. Mm -hmm. And then we, you graduate basically. So we do like a little graduation. Yay. You're now an underwriter. Mm -hmm. Here's a book of business. Go get them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. (laughs) So is, is were there people that went to training with you that didn't that didn't like get the job by CNA? No. So if you're in the training program, you already you have a job. job. Okay. You already got the job. So they so. already like your soft skills. Yes. They just want to learn, yep. teach you the. Yep. Exactly. The, okay. So once you get in, you're in. Um, some people didn't realize they didn't like it, so they left, which is totally fine too. Yeah, better those six months than like yes. five years down the road. Yeah, and, once you're five years down the road, it's kind of hard to leave because yeah, restart life. Five years is when you finally know what insurance is and how to underwrite it and how to do your job. It's like that break point. Yeah, and you're comfortable and you know what you're doing. To leave into a different industry takes a lot of work. <laughs> that is really cool like i had no idea that insurance companies offer that like i really hope this um episode it like you've already opened up my eyes but i really hope like it opens up the eyes of a bunch of kids that are like in high school and college listening 
um, that you don't have to be like a science major or a, or like a computer geek, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you hang out with people, you tell them how you can make their life a little bit better, mm-hmm. save their business, and you get paid for it. Pretty much. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, when are you planning to retire? Whew. Is uh, it, what is it like? What's, what is, do insurance people even retire? Like, is it that fun? Is it so fun where people are like, yeah, I'm doing this. For I life. will tell you, I've worked with like 70 year old producers that just, they have assistants doing everything. They come into the office. Some of them don't even have a computer. They just show up and hang out kind of. Yeah. They just, some of them don't know how to retire. <clears throat> yeah. I think that is based on an individual person. If you have enough hobbies that you like to do outside of work, um, I'm pretty sure you'll retire at a decent age mm-hmm. and go enjoy those hobbies. Um, but I don't know when I'm going to retire. I think there's such a good work-life balance for me here where I still get to go and travel and be able to put all of my work on hold and go spend time with family. Um, I'm still enjoying life because I feel like a lot of jobs, you just work, work, work. You're never taking time off. Yeah. And then by the time you retire and you have all this money saved up, your your health is not there. You can't travel. You can't enjoy life. Um, insurance isn't like that. And that's what I've experienced for the last years. I still get to go out and enjoy my time. And I'm still living a life aside from my job. Mm-hmm. Um, so honestly, I, do, I don't know. I mean, I like anyone else, I think I would try to get out the minute I can. Like yeah, as yeah. soon as I have a retirement plan and everything is all set for me. Let's go. I mean, there's going to be people under me that are going to be wanting me to leave so they can take my position <laughs> and take my place. That's for sure. Especially with after this podcast, all the kids are going to be like, all right, let me go work for Diana. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you hire people? Um, Like if some, and maybe I'm assuming this incorrectly, mm-hmm. but like how insurance agents hire somebody under them to work mm-hmm. for them. um, And then they get like a small profit or mm-hmm. a commission from what they have. Is that kind of, does that have anything to do with you or is it nothing? At no. All? So we're a big corporation. We're a huge company. So we have HR that hires. They do all of the hiring. So there's none, and there's none of that like pyramid yes. stuff. So for me, the only way that I can get someone in is recommending them. I can go to my manager and say, hey, we have a position open. You know, I think this person would be great for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for how much a- does that cost? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a trip to Hawaii? <laughs> okay. Uh, we're past Hawaii. I want like Maldives or something at this point. <laughs> you heard it. You heard it here. Okay. Um, but I can recommend. Um, I think there if if they hire someone that I've recommended, I think there's like a small little bonus they pay that unfortunately gets taxed once it hits your paycheck. <laughs> yes. But it's nothing like like producers. That's a okay. different story for them. For them, they hire someone and sometimes they pay a salary. Sometimes they make them work on just commission and build their own book. For us, it's not like that. Okay. You get paid a salary the minute you start working for CNA. Okay, Let's talk about producer. You mentioned that a few times and I, every time I think movie. Um, but oh, so producer is basically say, same thing as an agent, a broker. It's an they work for agency. We call them producers. And they work, so some of the bigger agencies, when you start working for them, they'll give you like a base salary and Mm -hmm. they'll expect you to eventually grow a book where that salary will be replaced by your commission. Okay. Bring it down to (laughs) earth. Uh, Grow a book. What are, what, what are yeah, it? so producers, like we talked about, they... they so producers like an agent. Agent, That yeah. sends you business. Mm-hmm. Okay. They work on commission. Okay. Some of the, some of the larger, or um, I mean, majority of the agencies, if you're a new producer that's starting, mm-hmm. they'll pay you like a very base salary. So something very small, just so that you have something to pay your bills. Okay. As, as you're learning, as you're building your book of business, basically your job is to go out your there. Your clientele. Your clientele. Okay. You go out there and you do cold calls, you knock on doors and you try to bring clients in. Okay. Um, once your commission starts building up, eventually the base salary goes away and it's mm-hmm. replaced by just your commission. So you're okay, gotcha. just, cl- just working on commission at that point. Okay. But it takes you're free floating. It. Like it's up to you if you're not getting paid because it's literally. You. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, on top of that, you have to keep your clients happy because if you're not doing your job, I can easily come in and steal your client and be like, hey, I can I can do a better job than he's doing. Like, this is what I can offer you. So you have to always like stay on top of your game and make sure that you're offering good service and mm-hmm. you're covering all your bases as well. So it can be a challenging job. I, I can kind of see that like, is the, <laughs> I can kind of see like a lot of drama happening in that type of There probably stuff. is. But then it's but, also nice because like I talked to some agents who've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years and they yeah. have clients 
as long as they have been in the business, like their first clients. That's that are talent. Still that's it's really cool to see that, you know. Um, and of course, like they're doing a good job. They're servicing. They're they know their stuff. Like yeah, when yeah. you're talking to them, they know their stuff. They know how to keep their clients happy and all of that. So I think it's really cool, like to be able to see that as well. It's a lot of the new producers right now that are up and coming. You'll see them go and try to steal this kind of business and it's yeah, hard. They but like sometimes they succeed. Guerrilla warfare out there yeah, trying to poach, poach yes. <laughs> clients from other people. Um, so you do contractors, commercial contractors. Um, does it matter if, if the if the business or company is like, a, is like an ESOP, if it's privately owned? Um, no, so that doesn't matter to me. Doesn't if, matter to yeah, you. Yeah, okay. if, if you're public or private, as is, long as is you're there, a contractor. Is there more? If a company is an ESOP, like an employee-owned company, versus like uh, owned by a CEO or the mm -hmm. president, is there different risk categories there or no? You will almost never see a contractor be an ESOP. At least I've never seen. It's mostly owned by individuals. An, okay. an, an one owner or maybe multiple owners. Um, I don't think I've ever run into a contractor that was an ESOP. Um, I don't. Why is that? Do you think? Just. Just kind of dust experience. Okay. Just how they are, I guess. I don't think there's a real reason behind it. Um, Unless they love their employees and want they want them to own the company. Yeah. Uh, but I I do sometimes have like once in a while that I rent into and I talk to other units because it doesn't come up very often on our end. Okay, gotcha. Um, but I don't think there would be a different way to underwrite it. Um, I and the reason I ask is because my company is an ESOP. Oh, really? Yeah. And okay. so and I and I agree with you. It doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Um. And so I there have... isn't a a different way of underwriting you still do what you do and if you have proper controls in place then it doesn't really the affect the, day, the insurance comes, comes out yeah because i think there's more um risk in terms of like you guys because you guys have stock options mm -hmm. and all of that and it's more like the uh dno which is like a different unit that does different epli and all of that there's like fiduciary coverages which is yeah it goes over my head as well <laughs> okay. i just know the names of them and i know when to send clients their way okay, but it's gotcha. a completely different like gotcha. bucket of insurance to learn um and it's it has nothing to do with just like your basic package which is what i do it would okay. make no difference if it's an esop or privately owned or whatever okay that makes sense dana i want to say thank you one for coming on two is i have a good feeling about insurance now good <laughs> like and about insurance agents not all of them are out there to, to cut your throat no. um <laughs> which is nice unless you have to go get car insurance or whatever or fire insurance on your house um so thank you for coming on and sharing the sharing kind of your your personal life your experience your career um i'm super excited about this because i didn't i didn't know that this can be like a legitimate like a, a legit job and it's not like mm -hmm. a one in a million uh opportunity where it might be good mm -hmm. like you literally this could be this is your like your stable yeah. job where you can show up and and, and do your thing yep. um so i hope anybody listening out there is excited uh because i had no idea i thought everything was like commission based mm -hmm uh and and crazy yes no <laughs> okay so that's there's cool. a lot more to it and it can be fascinating and if you get to a certain like at the place where i am now mm -hmm. i get to travel i mean i post all the time i don't know if you if yeah. you, you follow me you see like the places i get to go and the things that's I what get i'm to saying like i don't understand like <laughs> what, she's somebody's paying her under the table or flying her out to places <laughs> Yeah, I get to go and I get to enjoy little things like that once in a while. And there's a lot of work that goes into it. And you sit mm -hmm. behind a desk and you do a lot of work. But then once in a while, you know, your client's like, let's go golfing. Yeah. Let's go golfing. Are you a good golfer? No, I okay. suck. I've never tried and I'm scared to try. But yeah. I have a feeling eventually I'll need to. <laughs> yeah, to get some, especially contractors. I'm, I, I'm, They're I suck big at, on golfing. Yeah, I suck at golfing too. And we went to Top Golf last week. Um and everybody can like hit the ball and they all look like golfers and i'm i look like this old man that doesn't ha have no f golfing form or yes. whatever that's good that's gonna be me in a couple of weeks because i'm taking a couple of my clients to top golf in san jose yeah it was it was me. fun i guess but you look so <laughs> dumb every time you walk up yeah. to the ball but yeah with contractors they're all crazy into golfing yep 
Um, I guess that's how you connect with them because they mm-hmm. want some peace and quiet. It, it's okay. Yeah. Like I always tell, we are talking in the office, like uh, if you want a good reality TV show, bring it into the trailer. Like bring it to a few meetings. Like that's going to be the best show in the world. <laughs> that's um, true. But there's just too much private stuff out there. So it probably never happened. Yeah. But anyways, thank you for, thank you for coming. Thank you for thank making you. time. Of course. Thanks for uh, having me. If you guys like this, I did uh, like, share, subscribe, um, share with people that you think like would do awesome in this in this business uh, that wouldn't take trips to Hawaii. Um, but I feel like this is a great career opportunity mm-hmm. uh, for anybody young looking into something. And I know a lot of young people go into business. They graduate and they have no idea what to do. And especially with this like six month training program, you get to like hands on experience and you don't have to waste a bunch pre grad or, or any more years in school, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. And it's locally get your business degree, Sac State. Yeah. Um, and make a killing, raise a family and, 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 and go golfing or whatever. Yeah. So that's sick. Awesome. Uh, that's it. Peace. Yeah.